We're going to start chapter nine today. Um, I am going to. I don't get a lot of feedback, huh? Um, I'm going to be going fast for the first couple of pages because it's just introductory stuff that's not very exciting and not super important. So I am going to do a tiny bit of nomenclature, but we're not going to worry too much about nomenclature. Okay, so I, I, I probably will have a token nomenclature point question on the test, just so we know how to converse a little bit, and, um, but I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it. All right. <clears throat> in this chapter, we talk about al alcohol, ethers, and epoxides, and, and this is really a continuation of chapter seven, eight, and nine. It would just be such a huge chapter, so we don't put them all together into one chapter. So alcohols contain a hydroxy group, OH, which is an OH group, bonded to an sp2 or sp3 carbon. And so um, if we look here, we've got OH bonded to sp2 examples. We have, um, here's our hydroxyl. That's our hydroxyl group. This would be methyl. Okay, then if the carbon that's bonded to the OH has, has one R group, that would be primary. So one R group. If the carbon bonded to the hydroxyl is bonded to two R groups, it's secondary. Um, and then if it's bonded to three, it's tertiary. And so you're really actually already familiar with the tertiary because we've been using terputoxide, the conjugate base of this alcohol, um, throughout chapter eight. So that would be three R groups. All right, we also have some examples of uh, OH bonded to an sp2 carbon. Um, so um, this would be vinyl alcohol. That's a vinyl alcohol, also known as an enol. We'll come back to that term coming up in, in OCHEM. But that's also an enol. En is for the alkene and all is for the alcohol. So that's why it's called an enol. Um, this, would be, um, this would just be phenol. And then I skipped these two. Um, what would we call this alcohol right here? Allyl alcohol, I heard somebody say. So you, could, you can um, pat, pat yourself on the back for that. That's allyl alcohol. And this is benzyl alcohol. So that has a benzyl group of, um, bonded to the, let's just respell that, B-E-N-Z-Y-L. This is benzyl alcohol. Because there's a benzyl group bonded to the hydroxyl. Ethers have two alkyl groups bonded to an oxygen. The alkyl groups can be the same or they can be different. If they're the same, we call um, this is a symmetrical ether. And um, if they're not the same, this is an um, unsymmetrical ether. So nothing so terribly exciting. If the ether is part of a three-membered ring, it's an epoxide. So this is an epoxide. You will also um, see it in some textbooks called an oxirane. I learned it as epoxide, so I favor that term. You won't see me calling it an oxirane, but that's a, that's a common um, term also for epoxides. We're going to, like I said, very briefly going to do some nomenclature. Common names. We need, we need common names when we're talking. You know, so like, you know, alcohol, the kind that you drink. Um, that would be ethyl alcohol would be the common name. We can also call that ethanol. That would be, um, a, that would not be the common name. So if you're, so some of the, some of them we need to know a few. Okay, so um, IUPAC. Let's talk about IUPAC names. Um, following rules are used to name a compound that has a functional group suffix. Select the longest continuous carbon chain to which a hydroxyl is attached. The parent chain is named by dropping the E of the alkene and adding OL. 
and then um, so you're going to number the continuous chain to give the carbon bearing the hydroxyl the lowest number. This number is included in the name. So this would be, this is about the difficulty I would give you on a test. So let's, let's do that one. All right, so um, there's the longest chain. Um, five carbons, um, so it, that would be pentane, but we drop the E and add OL. So the parent, pentanol, that's our parent. And then um, we're going to number in the direction that gives the alcohol the, the um, lowest number. So we're going to number this direction here, one, two, three, four, five. So our substituents here, we have two methyls, so we have, um, and they're at carbon four, so we have four, four dimethyl. And so they're actually, now that we have all of those, um, there's two names that we can call this. You will see both. 4, 4 dimethyl, so 4 comma 4 dash dimethyl. Two, pentanol. Whoops. The two is there to tell you that the alcohol is on carbon number two. That's very important that you do that. Um, the other way you can name this is 4,4-dimethyl. Pentane, P-E-N-T-A-N, dash two, all. Okay, more common to see it the first way I named it. Um, so all, all we're doing here, the only difference here is we're taking and we're putting the two right in front of the OL rather than at the beginning of the pentanol. And both of those ways are absolutely acceptable for us. Question, yeah. No. There is no E after the pentane. We drop the E and add OL. So that's this right here. In the second one? Nope. We drop the E and add OL. So we do not add that E back in. No, we don't. Okay? If you have, it's like if you have an alcohol in a ring, a number is not needed to designate the position of the functional group suffix in a cyclic compound because it's assumed to be in the number one position. All right, so um, this is automatically going to get number one. So that hydroxyl, what we say is that hydroxyl has priority over all of the alkyl groups. It gets the number one position. Yes? That's a little bit different and we're not going to worry about that. Okay? So um, there would be a diol and we would put the numbers and, you know, and then we'd have other substituents. Yeah. That would be 1,2-diol, 1,3-diol, 1,4-diol, something like that. Okay. So we want a number in the, in the, in the direction to give this, the next substituent the lowest number. So it'll look like that. So a uh, number in the, in the direction to give the next substituent the lowest number. All right, so our parent, um, this is a six-membered ring, so it's a cyclohexane. We drop the E and we add OL. So the parent is a cyclohexanol. The substituents are, let me see what we have, A2-methyl. 
we have a 4 ethyl. No, a 5 ethyl. We have a 5 ethyl. Let's fix that. 2 methyl, a 5 ethyl, and so this would be 5 ethyl. Ethyl comes first because E comes before M in the alphabet. 5 ethyl, 2 methyl. Cyclohexanol. Notice I did not have to be put a one in front of the cyclohexanol. I didn't have to say cyclohexane one all because the one is understood. Okay, you think you could do that? Name something like that. Nomenclature of ethers. Okay, you know what, we're very briefly going to cover nomenclature of ethers. I'm not going to test you on nomenclature of ethers on the exam. How about that? Just be a regular alcohol. You know, when I was a student, um, it was really important to cover nomenclature because I had to go to the library and I had to look these things up in a book. And if I didn't know how to name them correctly, I would never find them in a million years now. All these search engines, you can actually draw the structure, and so it's not so critical that you know the exact name. So I kind of take it like that, and I say we've got to know a little bit of nomenclature so we can converse, um, but I, I don't want to be too hardcore about it. All right. Um, so, I mean, you'll see some, some uh, high school chemistry classes, and they say, oh, well, we taught some OCHEM in our class. And, and basically what that means is they did a little nomenclature. And that's like so not even at all touching organic chemistry, as you probably already appreciate, right? Okay, so common name. Name the two alkyl substituents in alphabetical order followed by the word ether. Are we going to be hardcore about alph alphabetical order on common names? No. Okay, um, IUPAC, name as an alkane with an RO substituent. An RO substituent is named by replacing the eel ending with oxy. So let me show you what we're talking about with that one. So this one, for example, let's name it common first. Butyl isopropyl ether. Butyl isopropyl ether would be the common name. Um, IUPAC. And, and what we would do is we would, we would take the longest of the chains or the one that's the simplest of the chains and that will be our parent. So this would be right here. That's our parent. So this would be butane. And then we're going to name number, we're going to name this, this other group. Um, this is an isopropyl group, right? So including that oxygen, it's an isopropyl group, so that's an isopropoxy group. So isopropyl, um, we're going to drop the YL because it has an oc oxygen and change that to uh, oxy. So this is isopropoxy. So that's our substituent, isopropoxy. So our um, IUPAC name would be 1 isopropoxy butane. All right, and so we could get like really hardcore on this if we wanted to. We're not. I'm not even going to ask you to name ethers, but if I name an ether, I want you to recognize what it looks like. And I would probably call it the, by, the, by its common name. Okay? So that's all I want to know for naming ethers. Um, questions so far? Anybody? Yes, up at the top. Um, is the one necessary? The one is necessary. So the only time the one would not be necessary is if it could only be a one. So in other words, um, this isopropoxy group right here, that could be here or it could be here. Okay, so that would be at number two. So we do have to distinguish those two possibilities. All right, so if, if it was an ethyl, then, you know, we would probably name it differently, but then there's only one place it could be. All right. Um,
separation of alcohols, ethers, and epoxides. And this is going to be basically a review reactions from chapter seven. So no news, no terribly new stuff so far. Alcohols and ethers are common products of nucleophilic substitution. If we want to make an alcohol, we take an al alkyl halide and hydroxide ion. Okay, that would be an SN2 reaction. Backside attack, kick off bromide. And we get an alcohol. So that's our synthesis of alcohols. We already know how to synthesize um, alcohols. We can't synthesize all alcohols that way, but we can certainly synthesize a large amount of alcohols that way. And ether is prepared um, by treating an alkoxide with an alkyl halide. This is known as a Williamson ether synthesis. So we, we're, we're now naming that reaction. We hadn't named it before, but we've already done this reaction over and over and over again in chapter seven. So when you take an alkoxide plus an alkyl halide, um, you have a Williamson ether synthesis. So let's write that down. So Williamson ether synthesis, alkoxide plus alkyl halide to make ether. Williamson ether synthesis. All right, so um, same ideas as the hydroxide. We're going to have the great nucleophile. This is going to be an SN2 reaction. Come in, do backside attack, kick off bromide as a leaving group. Here, instead of using an alcohol, we're using an alkoxide. So that is going to give us an ether. Great way to make ethers. All right, we have to be really careful here um, when we are synthesizing ethers. And the reason is, is this alkoxide base is pretty strong. And we know if we have a, a, a great nucleophile that's a strong base, we have to watch out for elimination. So we have to really pick our alkyl halides really carefully or we're going to get elimination as the major product. And when you're trying to synthesize something, you don't want the minor project, product to be major. All right, so for example here, this is a synthesis problem. So this is um, rather than give me giving you the two reagents and asking you to predict the product, you're asked to synthesize this. So this is probably one of the first times you've ever had to do that. We're going to start doing that a lot in this quarter. All right, so the following ether, choosing reagents that would give the best yield. So you can, as you can see, um, we want to use a Williamson ether synthesis. We want, we've got two possibilities. We could, um, let's give one possibility here. We can form this bond here. We've got two oxygen carbon bonds and we can form either one of those. Let's call that pathway A. And the other thing that we can do is we can form this bond. We'll call that pathway B. All right, so <clears throat> Williamson ether synthesis, alkyl halide plus alkoxide. If we're going to form this bond right here, which alkoxide would we use? This whole guy right here is going to be our alkoxide, so methoxide ion. So if we want to form this bond, we'd use a methoxide ion right here, and then this would be our alkyl halide. So an isopropyl halide. If we're going to form this, if we're going to form this bond on the other hand, right here, there's our alkoxide. Isopropoxide is our alkoxide. And then we'd use methyl, a methyl halogen. So methyl halide, bromide, iodide, chloride, something like that. So let's, let's write out those two possible pathways and see which one's going to be best. All right, so let's do um, route A first.
So if we're going to form egg, we would use isopropoxide and methyl iodide. We'll just use, we can use iodide, chloride, bromide. I'm feeling iodide right now. Okay, and when you're, in the, when you're in the driver's seat, you can pick whatever you want, okay? It's kind of a very powerful thing. All right, let's um, show route B. Now I'm feeling um, bromide this time. Okay, so route B, uh, I'm going to have uh, isopropyl bromide and methoxide. All right, so the question is, which route is the best, route A or route B? A is the best. Um, why is route B bad? Fantastic. You guys are doing great. Uh, route B is bad because we have a secondary alkyl halide and a strong base. And this is a strong base. If you do this route, you're going to have E2 as your major product. All right, so this guy's going to be the best. Alkyl halide is not hindered. Will we get any elimination with methyl iodide? No. Why won't we get any elimination? There's no beta carbons. No beta carbons means no beta hydrogens. So no elimination. All We have no competition for this reaction. We will get 100% of the product that we want. Okay, so um, alkyl halide is not hindered and um, has no beta hydrogens. Therefore, um, there will be no E2. Okay, so that's the route that you want to choose. So already so we're starting to have to be a little analytical here when we're figuring things out, which, which route we want to do. <coughs> Questions on that example, anybody? A hydroxide used to form alcohols and an alkoxide used to make an ether. An alkoxide can be formed by treating an alcohol with sodium hydride. All right, so. We're going to use sodium hydride to turn our alcohols into alkoxides. Acid base reaction, let's draw this out. Make sure it's favored in the direction we want it to go. So um, our, our conjugate acid is H2, so hydrogen gas. So I, have, I put the little gas symbol and the arrow means that it's going to bu bubble away. That's going to drive our equilibrium to the right, isn't it? And um, if we look up PKI, so, so this arrow just means this is going to bubble off reaction mixture. Well, we want to look at the the al we want to look at the um, acid on each side of the equation. Um, this is our acid on this side, so that's going to be pKa about six about 15, using our pKa's rounded to the nearest five. Um, this uh, this is our pKa. Uh, this is our acid over here. pKa is um, 36. That's not one of the ones you need to have memorized. I would have to provide that for you. All right, so we have definitely very powerfully driven to the right, and, um, but maybe there's a little bit of reverse reaction if we catch the H2 before it bubbles off the reaction mixture, that's possible. But um, at equilibrium, we have about, what do we have, 21, uh, 
1 to 10 to the 21. So if you didn't have me last quarter, basically what I did is I took the difference in pKa's and that means that at equilibrium, that's ignoring the fact that the hydrogen is bubbling off and driving it even further to the right. Um, we will have one molecule of, H of alcohol for every 10 to the 21 molecules of alkoxide. So this is a fantastic, this is, a, is that screen always shaking like that? Okay, it's stopping now. Okay, so that means this is a really good way to convert alcohols to alkoxides, right? It's essentially to completion. All right, so now let's go and look, uh, you know, the question comes, well, why can't we just use hydroxide to form an alkoxide from an alcohol? Well, let's look at that equilibrium and see if that's going to be doable. All right, we're going to do the same thing. Now we're going to use a much more familiar base. Let's try this again. All right. Oh, boy. Let's see what we got doing that. I'm staying away from that purple color. I'm superstitious. <laughs> That's when it froze up. Okay, so we've got this here. Okay, so we're all wondering and now you're just like really, it's really killing you. The, the anticipation is, way, is really killing you now. So we've got, um, there's our alkoxide. Okay, our conjugate base is water. Let's look at the pKa for each of these. Now the good news on these guys is that uh, for both of those, we know those pKa's rounded to the nearest five. That's part of the pKa's rounded to the nearest five. That's one of the, those are two of the, well, one of the eight, okay? So this is about 15 and this is about 15. So what that means is that, at, at, so we have a 50-50 mixture here. So um, at equilibrium, we have about 50-50. 50-50. So what that means is that we're not really going to be making enough of that, of that alkoxide to use it in a Williamson ether synthesis. Let's say we wanted, to make, um, we wanted to make ethoxide and we mixed it with hydroxide and then we added methyl bromide. Well, we're only going to be making 50% of that. So we're going to get a mixture uh, because we're not making enough of that ethoxide. So the base that we want to use definitely is, um, is sodium hydride, the base to use and this is the only base that I will use, the base to use to um, make an alkoxide from an alcohol. Okay. An intramolecular version of the Williamson ether synthesis provides a route to epoxides. Let's look and see what that looks like. H minus, that's our good base, that's the base we want to use. Let's do arrow pushing here. Now I'm going to keep this, alco this um, alkoxide in the same orientation that it's in because I want to point something out to you. Okay, so um, what's going to happen is, is, is this alkoxide is perfectly situated to do intramolecular backside attack and to kick off this bromide ion. Let's draw the product we get from that. Notice this is a three-membered ring ether, also known as an epoxide. So our nucleophile and our leaving group are in the same molecule. So let's label those. Here's our nucleophile and here's our leaving group. 
So we call this type of reaction where the nucleophile and the leaving group are in the same molecule as an intramolecular reaction. And so this is an intramolecular uh, Williamson ether synthesis. A molecule that contains both of these can actually undergo intra or inter. How do we decide? Okay, so really the question here is how do we know that um, this alkoxide is going to attack in the same molecule? Why can't that alkoxide come back and kick off the leaving group in another molecule? That would be inter that would be intramolecular. Intermolecular. When it attacks in the same molecule, it's intramolecular. All right, so let's see. Here's an example here. Let's see if we can decide. So this is CH2N, so we're talking about varying ring sizes. So let's do the intramolecular down here. Let's see what that would look like. A little bit larger ring, isn't it? But it's still the same thing. And if we do that, we form a ring. If we don't do intra and we do inter, let's draw that. Inter molecular. What would that look like? We would have um, this alkoxide come in, do backside attack, and kick off this leaving group in another molecule. So it kind of look like that. So what we would get is something that looks like this. That's what it would look like if it did intermolecular. So we want to be able to know what we're going to get. We want to be able to predict what we're going to get. And so how we know what happens is it depends on the size of the ring. So there's a, there's a magic number, three, five, and six membered rings. The ring is favored. The ring is favored. So if we can make a three-membered ring, and, and when we say the members of the ring, we're counting the oxygen. So this one up here, the epoxide, that's a three-membered ring. Um, and so if we can form a three, a five, or a six, the ring is going to be favored. If it's a four um, or greater than seven, so that's a greater than seven. It doesn't look like that, but, or I'm sorry, greater than six. That will make that easier to read here. Four or greater than six, ring is disfavored. And therefore, you're going to get um, the reaction on the top here, intermolecular instead. Questions on Williamson ether synthesis? Anybody? All right. We're going to talk about a new reaction called dehydration. It's going to look a little bit familiar to you. Um, it's going to look very familiar to you, hopefully. Um, there, we're going to, and so basically what we do is we take an, an alcohol, concentrated sulfuric acid, tosic acid, or H3PO4. Um, I will tell you that the only ones that I will use will be these two. So phosphoric acid I don't use. So I won't use that on tests for you guys. So what is, what is uh, tosic acid? Well, that's this guy right here, T-S-O-H. 
toxic acid. And so um, you can see it's in the same family as sulfuric acid. Basically, all we've done here is we've taken one of these hydroxyls off and replaced it with an R group. But they're both really, really strong acids. So we don't, we don't change, um, we change the, the acidity a little. We don't change it a lot. The reason why we sometimes like to use this acid instead of sulfuric acid is that this acid has better solubility with organic compounds because it's got that, you know, this, this hydrocarbon part here. Um, it's got better solubility. So that's it. Um, but those pretty much we're going to be using interchangeably. And so this one here is uh, more soluble in organic solvents. All right, we're going we're gonna, to um, we're gonna go through the mechanism now. Um, the mechanism depends on the structure of the alcohol, as you're going to see. Um, the first step will be the same for every alcohol. So first step for all alcohols. All right, so I'm, I'm, I'm very particular about mechanisms. Every professor has certain things they're particular about. And so for mechanisms, I always want the, the arrow to come from a pair of electrons, either a lone pair or electrons in a bond. And all of the atoms, that, all bonds that are breaking are drawn out. And um, everything that's involved in the arrow pushing needs lone pairs. So I'm going to do arrow pushing involving this oxygen only. So that means I don't have to put lone pairs on all these guys. But I do need to put lone, puts, lone pairs here, and I do need to put lone pairs here. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this hydrogen right here, and I'm going to break this hydrogen oxygen bond, just like that. So now all I've done is I've protonated the alcohol. So it looks like this. Um, our side product would just be the conjugate base of sulfuric acid. All right, so that's going to be the first step, whether we have a primary alcohol, secondary alcohol, tertiary alcohol. For the second step, secondary and tertiary alcohols go through an E1 mechanism. Okay, so let's, um, I'm going to draw a secondary alcohol here. So what we're going to end up doing is re-going through the same step here, but that's good because it's good practice. We've got sulfuric acid. If you don't want to draw out all those bonds, you just have to draw out the bonds that are being made and broken. So we can do this little business here if we want to save ourselves some time. Okay, so now we're going to come and grab this hydrogen. We're going to break the hydrogen-oxygen bond. And I'm actually going to draw reversible arrows. I'm going to come back and draw reversible arrows here. These steps are all reversible. We know that all the acid-base reactions are reversible. This one also is reversible. So secondary and tertiary alcohols go through an E1 mechanism. And that means that um, for secondary alcohol, E1 mechanism is faster than in E2. So uh, what happens in an E1 mechanism? This leaving group is going to leave. We're going to make a, a carbocation, and that's going to be our rate determining step. So RDS for rate determining step. All right.
Now we just learned e E1, so it's fresh on our mind. So what do we do in the second step of, in the first step of an E1? Our leaving group leaves. So the only difference here is our leaving group is water rather than a halogen. That's the only difference. In the second step of an E1, uh, we eliminate a um, beta hydrogen. So what are we going to use here for that? Let's see, what do we have here? Probably we, we have a little bit of, um, let's use the conjugate base of sulfuric acid. We have a little bit of water here in sulfuric acid, but not very much. It's usually like concentrated sulfuric is about 96%. We do have some um, alcohol. But let's, so let's just go ahead and use the conjugate base of sulfuric acid here to do this elimination. So the one thing I don't want you to do is just use a, a generic B or A for acid. I want you to use real things that are actually in there. So this is going to come remove beta hydrogen and there's our alkene. Mm, let me fix that. And you know what, and I'll draw those guys out. I think you guys like it better when I do that anyway. It's a little, e little easier to see. There's our alkene product. That's our dehydration product. So, um, and I, I want to go back here and do another reversible arrow here. Okay, so that's our product. Questions on, on that mechanism, anybody? That's the mechanism for dehydration of a secondary or a tertiary alcohol. Um, E2, um, primaries go through an E2. Why can't a primary go through an E1? Yeah, you can't make a primary carbocation, so. So why? Can't make a primary carbocation. All right, so let's draw it. We're going to still have the same first step, which is protonation of the hydroxyl. Why do we protonate the hydroxyl first? Anybody know that? Exactly. Exactly. We want to make it a better leaving group. Hydroxyl is a poor leaving group. PKA of the conjugate acid is about 15, so it's a terrible leaving group. We're not going to have it leave. So that's why we are protonating it so that it can leave more easily. All right, so since we're primary, we're not going to make a primary carbocation. There's our protonated alcohol ready to go, uh, except instead of having it leave first, it's going to leave as we remove the beta hydrogen. So we'll, we'll do our... conjugate base of sulfuric acid. If you want to do it abbreviated, it would look like this. This is going to grab the hydrogen. We're going to move electrons here. The leaving group's going to leave. Still reversible. There's our product. So that's the simple way of drawing, and I keep, I keep doing that. And I keep telling myself, you've got to draw it out. This is better for everybody. This is the way you, more easy way to see it. We'll draw it this way. All right, questions? Anybody? So E1, E2, do so you see how this is kind of a continuation of that previous chapter, chapter 8? 
We still have a couple of minutes, guys. Um, because of all these steps are reversible, this is an equilibrium process. The two sigma bonds broken in this reaction are stronger than the pi bond formed. Since equilibrium requires um, reactions favor more stable products, the equilibrium is favored to the left. In order to obtain an alkene product, the reaction has to be driven to completion. It's an uphill reaction. We have to drive it to completion using Le Chatelier's principles. System at equilibrium will react to counteract any disturbance in the equilibrium. So here's our complete reaction drawn out to drive the equilibrium. There's different ways to do this. Um, one way, and you'll do this in the lab, is to remove the um, alkene as it's formed. So you're going to be running, if you, if you have my lab, you, we've already done this. If you don't have my lab, later in the quarter you'll be doing this reaction. And your alkene is going to be a gas and it's going to be removed as it's formed. That drives the, the equilibrium. So like distill it off. And the other way is to um, keep the concentration of water low and to do that we use concentrated sulfuric acid. That's why we use concentrated sulfuric acid here. If we use dilute sulfuric acid it would go back the other direction. All right, we will stop right there and we will continue this on Wednesday. I hope you guys have a great um, long weekend.